All right. Thank you, Jordan, for the great intro. It's my first time joining this event and my pleasure to have a chance to present here. I can see a lot of fun events um, coming up. I will choose to join some when I can. All right, good afternoon. Oh, quick, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Tong Wei, Principal Solution Architect in Intelligence. I'd like to share with you my story as an introduction. I started my career as a software engineer in eBay 10 years ago. Out of curiosity, I joined a game company later. The company invested heavily in marketing. They invited stars like Maria Carey, Arnold Schwarzenegger for TV commercials, and they launched hundreds of campaigns and did aggressive real-time bidding's. I work in the data platform team to develop a product to help the marketers analyzing the data so they can visualize the ROIs. There was an initiative to pivot hundreds of gigabytes of data like analysts would do with Excel. Of course, Excel doesn't support loading in so much data. And that's where I learned Apache Kylin and the company called Kyligers. The first time I read the concepts of Kylin, I was completely sold by the brilliant idea. And the decision of joining Kyligens significantly changed my career path. I was geared with new domain knowledge, a bunch of new skills and a new mindsets. Today, I'm very excited to share my learnings with you. Who should care about this talk? If you are data analysts, data engineers, data scientists, or architects working with big data, or just interested in big data, big data, you may find this topic helpful. Here is the agenda. I will give an overview of the OLAP concept and then talk about Kylin basis. My colleague Kai, a rock star solution architect in Kyligence, and at the same time, an open source committer to the Apache Kylin project. We'll show you the demo and the roadmaps then we'll have some time for Q&A. To explain OLAP, online analytical processing, it's convenient to compare it with the OLTP, online transactional processing. In a typical organization like a bank or retailer, there are two systems running. One is for business operation, providing core business functionalities usually customer facing, for example, uh, bank deposit or online checkout. This system will generate significant amount of data. The other is for business intelligence. The decision makers need to understand how well the business runs. And he asks questions like, what are the top selling products in the store? The analysts provide reports to help business owners to adjust the strategy whenever needed. Due to the different purposes, the technical focus are quite different. In the OLTP system, data is kept in operational store that handles transactions, which requires real-time frequent updates. It is optimized for write throughput and the response to simple patent detail level queries on the up-to-date data. We are talking about small volume, like several megabytes to gigabytes here. While the OLAP system, they are more optimized for read performance of complex aggregated queries on historical data, which can be terabytes to petabytes in volume. The updates are acceptable to happen in periodic batch fashion. Also, the models being used are quite different. OLTP often chooses relational model, which is highly normalized, and the OLAP uses dimensional model, typically star schema, snowflake schema that are denormalized. Now let's look at the core concept of OLAP, cubes or multi-dimensional cubes. A cube looks like this. It consists of dimensions and measures. In data warehouse, we call different attributes of the data as dimensions. For example, location, time, category. Dimensions can be used for filtering, grouping, and the labeling. For visualization, I can only show you three dimensions. In reality, 
a cube can have more, many more dimensions, which, which is really a hypercube if you can imagine. Now it comes to measure. We call the numeric values used for calculation as measures. For example, revenue, cost, quantity. When you are asked a question like how many items are sold in apparel, Los Angeles, June, you can quickly look up the answer in the cube through its dimensions and measures. This, this looks nice and easy, but how is a cube constructed? In the data warehouse, all we have is a bunch of tables and the models. If we are given a star schema, it's straightforward to map it. Just find the dimension tables or look up tables as your dimensions, numeric values in the fact table as the measures. It was to point out that the data in the fact table is usually on a granular level. For example, the sales records of every transaction. The measure we see in the cube is a result of calculation. The calculation is called aggregation. Sometimes we add up the values to get a total. Sometimes we take the minimum, maximum, or count the records. Whether such aggregation happens on query time or pre-computed could greatly impact the query performance. Following are some typical operations with the OLAP cube. Row up is to reduce the dimension by performing aggregation on that dimension. In this example, we reduce the time dimension by adding the monthly sales item together. A drill down operation is on an opposite direction, looking into much more granular level. Instead of sales by month, you may be interested in sales by week. That's a further breakdown of the queue. And slicing is where you pick certain values of the dimension, make a slice out of the cube. While dicing is to select several values of couple dimensions, making a subset of the cube. With these operations, it's fairly easy to perform various kinds of analysis to meet the business needs. OLAP is not a new concept. These products are all typical OLAP implementations. However, we call them traditional OLAP because they have challenges with the more than massive data volumes. The cube is stored and handled in a single machine, which greatly limited the size of the cube or the number of dimensions. As a result, many cubes are created to fit the volume and it makes maintenance very difficult. Limited by the processing power, the time to build cube is very long. In the end, it's hard to scale. ITs have to purchase more and more expensive hardware to catch up with the growing volume. To overcome all these problems, Apache Kiting has taken the modern approach to combine the big data technology with the OLAP concept Cubes can be stored, processed, and queried in a distributed cluster. To the end user, it still appears as one logical cube. Apache Kiting is an extreme OLAP engine for big data. It was first developed by eBay and later contributed to the Apache Foundation. After a period of incubation, it successfully graduated into Apache top level open source project. Later, the founder team created the company Kyligence to provide enterprise software and services based on Apache Kyligence. Also actively contribute back to open source community. As of now, Kyligence has more than a thousand users all over the world, including some well-known companies. I'd like to highlight one use case to show you what does it mean by extreme high performance at massive scale. Meituan, a very popular group, um, group buying website company in China, 
has around 1 trillion rows of data. They have achieved 99% of queries running under 1.3 seconds with Apache Kylin. Kylin supports multiple query interfaces with NCSQL to interact with various kinds of applications. Kylin is a native Hadoop application that is compatible with the ecosystem and fully scalable. By the way, for your information, the word Kylin, we sometimes pronounce Keeling Keeling is the name of a Miss creator. It is named follow the, following the Hadoop naming convention. Apache Kiling provides a visualized modeling interface, also provides rich optimization and pruning functions to reduce the cube processing effort. The user does not need to write code. They only need to perform multi-dimensional modeling and analyze the data which greatly reduce the learning curve and the maintenance cost. In terms of architecture, Kylin can sit on the edge node of the cluster, meaning it does not require installation on every node of the cluster. A web server is started to provide a UI for project setup, model cube design, and job monitoring, API for programmable assets and interacts with other components in the cluster. The two supported data source listed here are Hive and Kafka. Hive itself is a powerful tool that can be considered as a data warehouse for mostly structured data on data lake. Kafka is a distributed streaming platform to enable near real-time analysis with Kylin. And the third type of data source, relational database will be supported very soon. Kylin uses the cluster's resource to build, build cubes. You have the choice of MapReduce engine or Spark engine for the build. The jobs are generated according to the cube design. No code is required. The cube data will be persisted to the storage layer. It is stored on HBase now, but very soon for those who do not want to use HBase, storage with a uh, Parquet on HDFS will be supported. BI tools or customized applications can connect to Kylin services to query data with JDBC, ODBC driver, or REST APIs. These two graphs show the star schema benchmark comparing Apache Kylin with uh, Hive. The green color shows the query latency of Kylin and the gray color shows Hive. On the left side, you can find the most responses of Kylin in sub-seconds, while Hive runs over five seconds, more than 10 times of a performance gain. On the right side, it shows that query performance of Apache Kylin does not change much with the data volume growth. That's the magic of pre-calculation. In fact, it is a true advantage compared to any MPP SQL on Hadoop solution. All right, enough talking. Now let me invite my colleague Kai to run the show. Thank you, Zitong. Thank you for sharing uh, your insights in Apache Calling. And um, next, I, I will give a demo. Actually, it's a video of the demo. I uh, recorded before to show how we uh, build our first Apache Kalen cube. Uh, it's quite simple. You just need four steps. You can easily create your first uh, Apache Kalen model and cube. So first of all, you need to connect to your data source. Normally we can support Hive or uh, Apache uh, Kafka as the data source. In this demo, we are going to use uh, Hive as the data source. And then you can uh, use Apache Kalen's web UI to create a, and design your model and cubes. Uh, after uh, designing the cube, you can trigger a job to load data into the cube, uh, waiting for a couple minutes or a couple of uh, uh, hours that when the cube is built, you can go ahead to run some queries against the cubes you built. All right, so let's go ahead to see the video. All right, uh, let's get started with this demo. 
first of all, we need to uh, connect it to the data source. In this demo, I'm going to use the hive data source. By clicking the model and choose data source, you can load all the tables from hive directly. Those are the uh, tables we have in the uh, hive. You can choose any tables you want to add it to the model. By clicking the sync button, all the tables will be added to their calling automatically. And then you can choose all the columns in these tables to the, to the model. After that, we can go ahead to create a model. By clicking the new model button, you can create a model. I'm going to use the existing model I prepared and show you how it looks look like in this model. All right, uh, first of all, you need to give the model a name and then you need to define the, uh, the join relationship between these tables. Just like what you did in relational database, choose a fact table and the join with the lookup, lookup table. Uh, set up the uh, join condition, the primary key and the foreign key, and then you can add it to the model. After define all the join condition and uh, define the table relationship, you will get a star schema or slope weight. That is a model. After that, uh, you can uh, choose the columns as dimensions from those tables. Apache Kaling provide a UI. You can just use the uh, drop-down list to choose all the columns you want to add as dimensions. And then we can go ahead to the measures. The same as dimensions. You can just use the drop-down list to choose all the columns you want to make it as uh, measures. All right. After defining the dimensions and the measures, we can go ahead to the last step. In this step, we need to define the partition columns. What is a partition column? Partition column is used to control the data range you want to load to the cube. Sometimes users, they don't want to load data to the cube at the same time. They want to control uh, how the data should be loaded. For example, uh, the common scenarios, we load data by uh, daily, weekly, or monthly. And then you can use this column to control the data range. All right, after setting all of these configurations, we can save this uh, model. model. Uh, all right, we already have a model. And then we can create a cube in this model. By clicking the new cube button, uh, we can create a new cube. Let's uh, see our existing cube, how it looks like. All right, first of all, you need to choose uh, which model should we use to create this cube, and then give the cube a name. After that, we can choose the uh, dimensions in this cube. Maybe you will ask why we need to choose the dimensions and measure again, since we already do that in the model. That's because you can create more than one model, uh, one cube in a model. You can assign the dimensions in the model to different cubes based on your business scenarios. By clicking the checkbox uh, in front of the columns, you can add it to uh, the cube. All right. Uh, after defining all the dimensions, we can go ahead to define the measures. Apache Kaling provides uh, a lot of uh, functions you can use to define the measures. Uh, for example, here we have a measure defined with the top end functions. In this measures, we are going to know uh, the top 100 uh, sellers based on their uh, total sales amount in their last year. And then we'll show their seller ID in this uh, measure. Uh, just like this, you can define more uh, dimensions and measures uh, as your business needs. After defining the measures, we can go ahead to another step. In this step, uh, we don't need to set too much, just uh, leave it at the default value. All right, in the advanced setting page, there are a lot of uh, settings you can use to optimize the cubes and uh, uh, pruning the cubes to get a better performance and uh, uh, less building time. Uh, I'm not going to deep into the optimization today. We can leave it for further discussion. All right, uh, in the next step, uh, there are some calling properties you can set in this page to override the global settings. These uh, configurations will only take effect in the cube level, so it won't uh, affect other cubes. All right, uh, after save these cubes, 
we can go ahead to load data to this cube. By clicking the build button, you can choose the data range you want to load data. If you remember the partition columns we introduced in the model design, this is uh, how we use the partition columns. And you can choose uh, the data range you want to load. By clicking the submit, it will generate a new job to load the data. And this job is created automatically. It will generate the MapReduce code automatically based on the cube you designed to fetch the data, uh, processing the data, and uh, build the cube. After this job finished, you can go ahead to run some queries against uh, the cube. Uh, here, I prepared a, a cube which is already built. And let's run some uh, queries against this cube. All right, uh, let's run this query. In this query, I'm, I want to know the total sales of books by months and the category. Let's try to write. Okay, uh, you can see this query returns in uh, 0 0.1 second. Uh, because this demo system, uh, we don't have too large uh, data volume. It's a quite small environment. Uh, but you will have the same query performance if you using uh, even larger uh, data volume, for example, the uh, billions of rows or trillions of rows. Uh, and you can see this query is as answered by the cube, which is uh, we prepared before. You can see the cube's name here. Yeah, let's run uh, one more query. In this query, um, uh, we want to know the top five sellers in the year of 2012. And we are going to use the top end measures we introduced in the cube design. Let's try to run this. All right, this query returned in uh, 0 0.1 second. And you, you can see this query is answered by the cube as well. All right, uh, that's all about the demo. Okay, um, next I'm going to introduce the roadmap of Apache Kotlin. Um, there are a lot of exciting features going to be published in following releases. You definitely don't want to miss them if you are using Apache Kotlin or you are interested with Apache Kotlin. So uh, let's go through the roadmap. First of all, let's take a look at fully on Spark. The community has been focused on replacing Hadoop with Spark for a long time. If you are familiar with Kotlin, you may already know that there is an alternative building engine implemented with Spark. The next plan is fully replacing MapReduce and Hadoop component totally. By doing this, Kotlin can abandon the heavy dependencies of Hadoop and also get better building and querying performance. For example, Kotlin no longer needs Yarn and Hive server in the future because we can run a standalone Spark cluster instead of Yarn or run Spark cluster on top of Kubernetes. The next major feature is the new Parquet storage engine. Picture base is good and fit for some business scenarios. That's why we choose HBase as the storage engine at the very beginning. But we also find, find that HBase does not perform well when dealing with complex query scenarios, especially for those scenarios including many dimensions. And maintaining a large HBase cluster is always a challenge for most companies. To solve this issue, after a long period of discussion, the community decide to replace HBase with Apache Parquet and build a new story engine. You can expect that the new story engine can bring better query performance and reduce the maintenance cost. Um, I want to combine the following three key features together, Dockerize, Kubernetes, and uh, Cloud Ready. As we all know, more and more users are migrating their business from on-premise to cloud. And more and more users are adopting data lake architecture in the cloud instead of a traditional architecture. To embrace this change, the community plan to make Apache Kotlin more suitable to the cloud. By dockerizing Apache Kotlin and integrating with Kubernetes, 
we can deliver Apache Kotlin quickly and easier. Users do not need to worry about the complex dependencies and environment issues anymore. And with that, Apache Kotlin can be deployed in any common cloud platform easily without any capability, capability issues. Okay, so this is all the information about the roadmap. If you have any uh, interest, you can visit our website for more information. I hope this sharing can help you better understand Apache Calling and OLAP. If you are interested in Apache Calling and want to learn more about it, you are welcome to join the community. You can join the community by uh, forking our project in GitHub or sub subscribe our uh, mail group. And you are very welcome to join our Slack channel as well. Thank you. Uh, I will give it back to Jordan for a Q&A session. All right, perfect. Thank you both so much. We can give them a little round of applause. Great job. Um, you you got to have your Zoom, your, uh, your windows open so you can see everyone applauding. Um, does anyone have any questions um, for, for Kai or for uh, Taylin, Taylong? Let us know. You can either put your question in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. All right, so um, I am not a data scientist, so um, pardon me if this is like an obvious question, but so from what I'm gathering, um, Apache Kylin is a data processor, not a like not a database, right? It's not a for storage. Is that correct? Yes, it's not uh, really a storage. Um, actually, Apache Kylin can sit on a data warehouse and uh, it's mainly used for processing and uh, supporting um, OLAP queries. Gotcha. That makes sense. So when you're when you're building a cube, are you pulling specific information from your database and preparing it? Is that what's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the data source uh, we we show the on Hive or uh, Kafka. So Kylin can pull data from those uh, data source, and then um, it will. Uh, do the pre-computation and uh, and uh, store the cubes um, back into the Hadoop uh, file systems. Ah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so someone from the chat, RS, is asking, how is Sparks used in OLAP processing? Um, Kai, do you want to take that or? Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, we at the very beginning, we're using uh, MapReduce to do the uh, OLAP processing. So we will uh, translate the model design and to MapReduce job. And for example, if you pick um, several dimensions from uh, each tables and you link them together, and we know, okay, we can write a, a MapReduce job to gather data uh, from the data source and join them together and do a project on the uh, flat table, choose the columns you picked in the model. And if you design uh, some uh, example, the aggregation functions like sum or count or count distinct, and then we can write some, uh, actually generated some code uh, based on your design to go by the columns you choose and uh, store the result in the cube. That's uh, how it works. So what we did uh, uh, migrating from uh, MapReduce to Spark is quite simple. So we rewrite the Hadoop, uh, the MapReduce job with Spark. Uh, so uh, ideally it's kind of a Spark SQL. It's quite easy. So uh, if you want to uh, calculate some uh, result in the once, you can just uh, run some uh, uh, SQL and uh, execute it with uh, Spark SQL and then start it in queue. 
uh, it's something like a materialized view, but it's uh, a little different because uh, when you write a materialized view, you have to maintain different uh, views according to different business requirement, right? And in Apache Kotlin, we don't need to maintain those uh, materialized views. Uh, we can generate a kind of a materialized view uh, automatically based on your design of the model and cubes. So uh, uh, in short, we use uh, Spark SQL to, uh, to run the queries and load the data, uh, calculate the result, and store it in, in the cube. Awesome. Um, we have another question from Kimberly. Um, they, she says, so Kylan can do the SQL processing, correct? How would you then transfer the cube you process slash analyzed into some py into say Python for data engineering or model usage. Okay, um, that is a good question. So, uh, so basically, cube is kind of a, a storage, and you can uh, expose the cube with uh, different ways. So. Uh, Apache Kotlin provide a SQL interface. You can write any um, uh, ANSI SQL. It's just like what you did uh, with a normal database against the cube. Um, so if you are using, uh, for example, Python or other uh, applications, you can uh, use the SQL interface. Like you can use uh, Alchemy uh, in their uh, uh, Python the Alchemy library and to uh, issue some queries directly to the queue. And um, you can also use uh, JDBC or ODBC drivers to fetch data from the queue. And we also provide a, a RESTful API. You can call the RESTful API to send some queries uh, to the queue as well. Nice. That's awesome. Okay. Um, do we have any last final questions? I think you guys did a really great job of, of covering everything. Um, so one more time, just a little a round of applause. Thank you guys so much, um, Zaytong and Kai, for um, joining us tonight. Um, this, if you are wanting to follow along with, um, with the presentation at all or go back and revisit. This is going to be recorded and posted onto the Women Who Code YouTube, which we will also share in our, our Slack channel as soon as that is up. Um, so thank you guys, everyone, for joining and um, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.